Good morning, all. It looks like we do have a quorum with Petaluma, North Marin, Valley of the Moon, Santa Rosa, and Sonoma. Um, let's see, I noticed uh, we have some alternates, both from Windsor and Bronner Park. I'm not sure if they're filling in. Um, Secretary Manis, could you either unmute or promote Shannon Catula from Windsor and Vanessa Garrett from Roner Park, and we'll see if they're filling in for their their reps this morning. Good morning, Shannon. Are you here for Windsor today? Yes, I am. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. And good morning, Vanessa. Are you here for Runner Park? Good morning. Yes, I am. Okay. So I do think uh, we are ready to go then. Um, so we'll call the meeting to order. It's 9.03. And um, just a reminder that if you are not speaking, uh, please keep your um, microphones muted. And also, um, if you are a member of the TAC, if you could do your best to please keep your camera on for the entire meeting, uh, we greatly appreciate that. Uh, with that, uh, Secretary Manis, can we have a roll call, please? And a reminder to folks to please uh, state your name and agency when we do the roll call. Thank you, Chair Burke. City of Katati. City of Petaluma. Hello, Stan Herrera, City of Petaluma. Thank you. City of Roanoke Park. Hi, this is Vanessa Garrett, City of Roanoke Park. Thank you. City of Santa Rosa. Good morning, Jennifer Burke, Santa Rosa Water. Thank you. City of Sonoma. Hi, Matt Wargula, City of Sonoma. Thank you. North Marin Water District. Uh, Tony Williams, North Bryn Water District. Thank you. Town of Windsor. Shannon Catula, Town of Windsor. Thank you. Thank you. Valley of the Moon Water District. Good morning. Matt Fulner, Valley of the Moon. Thank you. Uh, Marin Municipal Water District. Uh, Paul Sellier, Marin Municipal Water District. Thank you. Additionally, it appears there are a number of attendees today. Um, uh, on Secretary Manis, real quick, uh, Katati joined just a little late, so can you call on them, please? Thank you. City of Katati. Yes, Craig Scott, City of Katati. Thanks for looping me in. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, going okay. forward with... Yes, public, please. Thank you. Thank you. Additional attendees on Zoom are Brenda Edelman, Colin Close, Dale Roberts, Elise Mir... Uh, Elise Miller with Santa Rosa Water, uh, Eric Miller, Jake Spalding, Sonoma Water, Kent Gilfie, Kimberly, Kimberly Zunino, Santa Rosa Water, Margaret DiGenova, Peter Martin, Santa Rosa Water. We also have on from Sonoma County Water Agency, uh, Scott Carter, Paul Piazza, Grant Davis, Don Seymour, David Manning, and Brad Sherwood, Andrea Rodriguez. And I think I've captured everyone. Oh, and we just had another attendee join. Hang on. Jay Jaspers. Great, thank you so much. Okay, we are now going to move on to item two. Um, as folks may recall, uh, we are still in a health emergency. And uh, per AB um, 361, we are still making findings to be able to meet virtually. Um, so the uh, memo and uh, resolution is before the talk. Um, 
Any questions or comments from TAC members on this item? All right, seeing none, before we take a motion, we'll open this up for public comment. If you'd like to make public comment on item one, uh, please raise your hand via Zoom if you are on the phone, which I don't think we have anyone, but if you are, dial star nine to raise your hand. And uh, Secretary Ledesma, do we have anyone for public comment on this item? We do not have any public comments. All right. Uh, is there a motion for this item? So moved. All right. Second. I'll second, yeah. Okay, so I caught uh, Valley of the Moon moved, and I'm sorry, who seconded? Uh, Craig Scott, Katati. Okay, and Katati second. All right. And Secretary Manis, can we have a roll call, please? Thank you. City of Katati. Craig Scott Katati, yes. City of Petaluma. City of Petaluma, yes. City of Rohnert Park. Vanessa Garrett, Rohnert Park, yes. City of Santa Rosa. Jennifer Burke, Santa Rosa Water, yes. City of Sonoma. Matt Ragula, City of Sonoma, yes. North Marin Water District. Tony Williams, North Marin Water District, yes. Town of Windsor. Shannon Catula, Town of Windsor, yes. Valley of the Moon Water District. Matt Fulner, Valley of the Moon Water District. Thank you. Let the record show that that motion passed unanimously. Great. Uh, thank you. So we will now meet virtually uh, for the next at least 30 days. We can meet virtually. Um, we will now go on to item three, which is public comment on non-agenda items. So we are now taking public comment on non-agenda items. If you want to make a comment from Zoom, please raise your hand. And if you are on the phone, dial star nine. And Secretary Ledesma, do we have any public comment on this item? We do not have any public comments on this item. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, we'll now move on to item four. Um, and these are the uh, September 12th um, minutes. Do we have any questions or comments from TAC members on this item? All right, seeing none, we are now taking public comment on item four. If you're on Zoom, raise your hand. If you're on the phone, dial star nine. And anyone wishing to make public comment on item four? Uh, Secretary Ledesma, do we have any public comment? We do not have any public comments. Okay, and uh, Secretary Manis, uh, can you please do a roll call vote uh, of the TAC members? Oh, sorry, we need a motion in a second. My bad, Thank you. sorry. Is anyone willing to make a motion on this item? Sorry, there was someone outside my door. They distracted me. Tony Williams, Northman Water District. I'll, I'll move this item. Thank you, Tony. We have a second. Shannon Catula, Town of Windsor, second. All right. So we have a motion from North Marin and a second from Windsor. Now, Secretary Manis, can you do a roll call vote, please? Thank you. City of Katati. Craig Scott, Katati, yes. City of Petaluma. Dan Herrera, City of Petaluma, yes. City of Rohnert Park. Vanessa Garrett, Rohnert Park, yes. City of Santa Rosa. Jennifer Burke, Santa Rosa Water, yes. City of Sonoma. Maragula, City of Sonoma, yes. North Marin Water District. Tony Williams, North Marin Water District, yes. Town of Windsor. Shannon Catula, Town of Windsor, yes. Valley of the Moon Water District. Matt Fulner, Valley of the Moon Water District. Matt, I'm sorry, I did not hear you. Can you please repeat your vote? Yes. Thank you. Let the record show that this motion passed unanimously. Great, thank you all. Okay, so we will now move on to item number five, 
which is our water supply conditions and temporary urgency change order. And uh, Don Seymour with Sonoma Water will be making the presentation. Don? Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning, members of the DAC. So start, starting with Lake Mendocino, um, storage is currently just a little over 40,600 acre feet. Um, compared to last year's storage, which, which was about 14,800 acre feet. So the reservoir is about 26,000 acre feet higher than it was last year. That's good news. Um, and you know, a lot, you know, a lot of that has has been to do with you know filing the temperature change petition and, and reducing those minimum stream flow requirements. So we have uh, observed um, demands on the river um, drop quite a bit, and in response, we've made a number of uh, release reductions, particularly from Lake Mendocino. Releases are currently about 60, 60 CFS. Um, Lake Sonoma is uh, currently uh, just a little over 110,000 acre feet compared to um, a little, uh, just under 109,000 acre feet last year. So 1,200 acre feet more. So basically the reservoir is in about the same same condition it, it was last year. Um, and it's currently losing about 200 acre feet per day. Um, we continue to manage the system under the uh, existing order that was issued uh, at the beginning of the summer. That order expires on December 13th. Um, we are continuing to do the monitoring and reporting requirements. A um, couple things uh, in the current order, uh, the state board had included um, a term and had made some typos that they're correcting. They are actually amending our order and they're removing a term that required some habitat surveys that we had done last year that would have been redundant to perform again this year. So um, we will be seeing an amended order probably by the end of the week. Uh, and um, other than that, we are moving forward to um, file another temperature change petition, and that's really in response to the condition of the Potter Valley project. Um, uh, pg e we anticipate, will continue to um, just make transfers to meet their uh, their FERC obligations and their obligations to, in their contract to Potter Valley Irrigation District. So just like last, uh, last year, we'll be filing a temperature change petition to um, have the, have the minimum stream flow requirements determined based on storage thresholds at, at Lake Mendocino. We hope to file that in the next uh, two weeks so that they have, the state board has plenty of time to, to process that order and have it in place before that December 13th deadline or expiration date. That's all I have, Jennifer, unless there's any questions. Great, thank you, Don. Um, is there, are there any uh, questions uh, from any members of the TAC? All right, seeing none. Oh, sorry, my computer is going a little bonkers this morning. Hold on one second. Um, okay, so uh, no questions from uh, TAC members, no comments from TAC members. Thank you for the presentation, Dawn. Um, uh, just, just for clarity uh, for the TAC, um, the requirement in the um, uh, temporary urgency change order has the reduction in diversions through the end of this month. Uh, is that still the case? Are we thinking that there's going to be any changes or extension from state water board? No, not anticipating that at all. And also, um, if we do have do end up getting some storm events that take the flows up to 125 CFS at Hacienda Bridge before that, um, the term goes away also, Jennifer. Okay. Well, let's hope for some storms in the horizon. <laughs> um, but then I also, I think I noted uh, earlier, and I don't know, Don, this may or may not be an answer you have, but with the last uh, storm that came through, the State Water Board lifted some of their uh, curtailments for a little bit of time. Are those back in place, or are they still lifted as of this moment? They're still so they're still suspended, and that was primarily riparian rights that they they um, suspended those curtailments. And so, um, and that a lot of it just has to do also with you know demands on those <clears throat> those, those demands on those permits really really dropping down. Mm -hmm. So, and that's part of what we've seen in the river that there, there's just not a lot of demand on the river right now. But, so you're not yeah. really seeing an impact from that system. No. Great. Any other questions or comments from CAC members? 
All right, seeing none, uh, we'll now open it up for public comments. We're taking public comments on item four. If you wish to make a comment, please raise your hand on Zoom. If you're on the phone, dial star nine. And Secretary Ledesma, do we have any public comment on this item? We do not have any public comments. All right, great. Thank you so much for your presentation, Don. Yep. All right, we will now move on to item six, the Sonoma Marin Saving Water Partnership. Um, item 6A is our 2022 water production compared to 2013. Um, as folks may recall, we are still reporting based on some legacy requirements from the State Water Board to uh, compare to a baseline year of 2013. And uh, you all should see the handout, uh, but we do show for August, um, we had a, a total 22% reduction uh, compared to August of 2013. And then uh, year to date compared to uh, 2013, we're at a 26% reduction. Um, you'll also see uh, the chart is showing um, comparison of 2021-22 deliveries to 2013 deliveries. Again, we're significantly less than we were compared to that time. GPCD information also shows that our customers are doing a great job saving. And then if we look at the chart on the back page, um, you'll see our most recent uh, GPCD information uh, that shows even with uh, increases in population, uh, total water use is significantly less than it was in the past, and our um, efficiency continues to go up with gallon per capita per day showing uh, we're, we're really low uh, in this region. Are there any questions or comments on item 6A? All right, seeing none, we'll open it up to public comment on item 6A. Um, if you are uh, on Zoom, please raise your hand. And if you're on the phone, dial star nine. And Secretary Ledesma, do we have any comments on public comment on item 6A? We do not have any public comments. Okay. Um, oh, shoot, sorry. I think I was also covering the cumulative diversion. I thought Paul was covering that, but I think that was on my agenda. Sorry about that. Um, I'll retake public comment, but the other thing, if you look at the second um, handout for item 6A, you'll see our cumulative Russian River diversions uh, for 2022 compared to 2020 as required by the term of the order. And uh, as of the information from last week, we were at an over 30% reduction in diversion. So again, we're seeing our community do a great job um, on that as well. Any questions on that document either? Okay. And again, I'll just reopen for public comment on item 6A. Uh, if you're on Zoom, raise your hand. If you're on the phone, dial star nine. And do we have any public comment on this item? We do not. All right. We'll now go to item 6B, which is our drought outreach messaging. And uh, Paul Piazza and um, Andrea Rodriguez from Sonoma Water are making the presentation. Great. Good morning, everyone. I'll go ahead and get us started this morning. Please, Paul, feel free to jump in as we go. Uh, but here is your outreach update for the month. Next slide, please. Uh, we did our usual messaging. So thanks to our, our, WAC, our um, contractors and their outreach, we messaged on drip systems, tree care systems, gray water, rain harvesting, and our water smart plants. Uh, we specifically had a great gray water um, radio show on KBBF. So we're also making sure we reach our bilingual community. You might have seen us streaming on Comcast, our print digital ads, mostly with our cinema media partners, videos, social media, and again, radio. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, we were out in person on a beautiful soggy Sunday morning out at the Fiesta Independencia at the LBC with our cinema water partners. Um, and while the turnout was a little bit light and it was hard to pass out our drought kits while they were filling up with rain, um, it was great to be out there. It's a great annual event. So 
uh, at least we we were out there. Everyone was out there getting a little soggy. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. This one, unfortunately, a uh, last minute cancellation. We had one more pop-up we thought was gonna happen in Petaluma and we just found out it got canceled. So unfortunately the slide is uh, just out of date a little bit. So, but we had a great series of summer pop-ups and we wanna thank all the water contractors um, who put on an event at their farmer's markets with their hardware stores. It was a really great way to do some outreach um, in a coordinated effort. Next slide, please. Um, and lastly, we have our virtual town hall that we're partnering with our county communications team. So this is coming up next Thursday, the 13th. Um, we have a lineup of Brian Garcia from the National Weather Service, who's gonna give a little bit more of a focused long-term weather prediction, if you will, um, as well as Brad Peterson, who's gonna talk about vineyards and how they use water. And then we'll have another speaker, Jeremy, uh, that will talk to the well owners and well health um, to sort of address the county well permit discussion that's going on in that level. So please tune in next Thursday for our drought town hall, or feel free to share it as well on social media to let everyone else know what's happening. Those are a great resource. And next slide, please. Ah, there you go. Ta-da. If you have any questions or if you need anything, please uh, let Paul or I know. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the tech on this item? All right, seeing none. Um, I also would just like to echo the thanks to everyone about the um, pop-ups this summer. I think they worked out quite well and we uh, got to give out a lot of drought kits, at least in our area, which is great. So thank you all for that. Uh, we'll open it up on public comment for item 6B. If you wish to make a public comment on Zoom, raise your hand. And if you're on the phone, dial star nine. And Secretary Ledesma, do we have any public comment on this item? We do not have any public comments. All right, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so we will now move on to item seven, which is our Sonoma Water Tank Maintenance Program and Scott Carter with Sonoma Water, we'll be making the presentation. Welcome, Scott. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair Burke and members of the TAC. Um, so again, my name is Scott Carter. I'm uh, one of the operations engineers at Sonoma Water. And I was asked to, to give you an overview of the recently approved 10-year uh, tank maintenance agreement. So uh, next slide, please. So Sonoma Water owns and operates 18 water storage tanks, a uh, critical component in our water transmission system. We provide clean drinking water to approximately 600,000 residents in Sonoma and Marin counties. Total combined storage of these tanks is about 128.8 million gallons. These tanks provide operational storage that keep the water system running during power outages, um, provide equalization volume to meet uh, peak demands. So good stuff there. Next slide, please. We recently uh, entered a, a 10 year uh, agreement with Superior Tank Solutions. They were chosen from a, a competitive RFP selection process. The agreement uh, is just over 8.2 million funded through the water transmission budget. The, the end date on that agreement is August of 2032 with the ability to extend up to two additional years and we did retain uh, the ability to cancel this agreement at any time without cause if, if things weren't working out the way we wanted it to. So next slide, please. So the purpose of this agreement um, is to initially understand the condition of each tank. Um, and I'll talk about the, the 13 tanks here in the next slide a little more, but um, so originally we're gonna, we're gonna do a real good job of understanding the condition of each tank, followed by a maintenance and repair activities through the duration of the agreement that will include cleaning of the tanks, providing routine maintenance, uh, as well as minor repairs and on-call support um, as needed. Um, during this work, Sonoma will oversee Superior's uh, activities and we will continue to maintain full control of the system and the operation of the water storage tanks during the duration of the agreement. So this, this agreement is accomplished in, in a two-phase approach. Next slide, please. Next slide, Diego. Thank you. 
So phase one of of this work is cleaning condition assessment of 13 tanks. So we have 18 water storage tanks total. We recently recoded, uh, rehabbed two of those tanks, the forest fill tanks. And then we are actively uh, in our design section are working on the rehabilitation project uh, for three more tanks. So, so those five tanks are already underway. Um, so the remaining 13 tanks in this phase one work we're going to do um, a very thorough assessment of that. That's going to involve uh, draining the tank. So we're going to we're going to drain the tank back into the system. So we're not we're not wasting any water there. Um, we're going to isolate the tank, valve it off. Um, almost all of our tank sites, with the exception of Castania, we have multiple tanks at a site, and so we're going to take one tank offline at, at a time, such that the system nobody will be affected in terms of service and what have you. Um, so we're going to, again, we're going to drain that tank. We're going to, as the photo shows there, we're going to put scaffolding inside the tank. We're going to get in there and do a chemical rinse um, and get the tank as clean as we can get it. So um, just, you know, as clean as we can get it. We're going to do, uh, we're going to test the coatings interior and exterior to make sure that that there's no problems with uh, with matching with the coating that's gonna, that, that we're planning to do. We're going to put a magnetic flux leakage survey uh, equipment on the floor of the tank to look for uh, metal thickness, any signs of deterioration or what have you on the floor of the tank. And then uh, we're going to put a structural engineer up on that scaffolding inside the tank to get up close and personal with every part of, of that tank, um, both inside and outside. And so with that information, um, that'll all be put into a report. Um, so for these these 13 tanks, we're going to do as comprehensive a survey as we can that includes all this information. That's going to feed over to our design section at Sonoma Water, um, where they're going to take that information. They're going to prioritize these tanks in terms of, you know, if the survey shows that one tank needs more attention or sooner attention than the other, we're going to try to move that up the list. We're also going to use that in terms of budgeting, understanding kind of what kind of repairs may be necessary or regulatory upgrades such that when we do that bigger project, the, the recoat, the rehab, that, that we have the budget and, and we're planning to do that. So, that, you know, we're trying to eliminate those unknowns. Uh, next slide, please. So phase two of the work is for all 18 tanks. Um, so um, all 18 tanks uh, through the 10-year term, the term of the agreement, uh, this is accomplished in four parts. The first part are annual visual inspections. So uh, Superior is going to come out once a year per tank. They're going to take a look at the whole tank, you know, the interior, exterior structure, what have you. They're going to calibrate equipment, uh, cathodic protection, level, liquid level indicators. They're going to inspect the site perimeter, um, and they're going to look at uh, the tank opening screens, vents, as well as safety items, ladders, platform railings, making sure that um, that we're up to regulatory spec and what have you. And they're going to produce a re report on that for us um, to keep track of things. Uh, the next item in that work is tank cleanings. So about five years after we've done that initial cleaning, we're going to come back and like we did in the phase one work, we're going to drain the tank back into the system again, take that tank offline, pressure wash, pressure wash the tank, uh, to maintain, you know, water quality, uh, regulatory compliance. We're going to, again, inspect the interior uh, and prepare a report of that work. Now, um, yeah, next slide, please. So the next part of that is maintenance and repairs. Um, so if, if there are in one of those inspections and what have you, we've identified a need to do some repair, repair or maintenance. Um, we've maintained a, a certain part of this budget to go in and do what I would categorize as minor repairs. And so in terms of uh, complying with the public contract code, um, we, we can't do the full blown project, but if we see something in there, maybe touching up a coding or a regulatory upgrade, um, we're gonna use the ideas to keep that budget to do that and what have you. Ideally, that's gonna be coordinated with that, that cleaning that I just mentioned in the previous slide when we've uh, taken the tank offline and we can get in there. And so if we've got to do something like, I don't know, add a light stanchion where we've got to do some welding or something on the tank, we're going to try to coordinate that with that with that uh, cleaning where we take the tank offline, where we can get in there and have Superior touch up that coating where we may have 
have damaged it with with our repair activities and what have you. Um, and then the last piece is uh, emergency and non-critical services. So uh, on an as-needed basis, um, if, if we have an uh, emergency need for support services that are maybe about, uh, beyond our abilities, Superior has, has people available 24 seven to support us in that, as well as non-critical services. Um, and uh, again, everything's gonna be kept in a report. Next slide, please. So uh, this this uh, is way too the schedule is way too big to put up on the on one screen. So I, I just took a small snippet of it. I wanted to give you kind of a flavor of how the, the thing is programmed, the, the agreement is programmed. And so in year one, this this runs on a fiscal year. Um, so twenty two twenty three, we're going to you know these inspections. So that that phase one inspection that I talked about uh, doing that initial inspection of the tank. So for Annadale one, the plan is this year we're going to take that tank down and do that inspection, um, and then uh, we're going to do the other inspections as well. Annadale two is going to get a visual. Katadi one is one of our tanks that is currently in design, um, and so it's not going to get an inspection day because or and under this program because it had an inspection in that design program. And so we're going to do all of these inspections again. They're all they're all programmed in. The those enhanced washout inspections are the phase one inspection that I described earlier. Those occur. We're going to do about two to four tanks a year. So in year one we have I think two tanks, and then year two I think it's four four, and then they're all going to be those are all going to be finished uh, within within the first four years of the contract. And then, as you see in the lower right corner, Forestville tanks were those tanks that were already inspect or already recoded a couple of years ago. Uh, in year five, we're going to take that tank down and do that cleaning that I mentioned earlier, where we're going to take the tank back offline and, and do that wash down. And then, you know, at year six, seven, eight, that's going to be the same thing for different tanks. So just kind of a, a flavor of how how those schedules or how that schedule kind of plays in there. And then um, we're gonna meet internally when, we, when we're ready to take these tank offline and, and make sure and coordinate all those activities. So, you know, we're having the least amount of impact as possible. And, and we're gonna communicate that back to the TAC community, uh, committee. So, so you guys are informed on, in terms of those or if there's any operational constraints or what have you. Um, next slide, that's, yeah, that's it. So um, I just wanted to reiterate that this agreement is part of a larger approach. Um, it's the first step in terms of understanding the condition of those tanks and then providing that maintenance, that ongoing maintenance um, program for the next 10 years. But really the, the, the focus or the beauty of this is that it, it feeds into our design section that's doing the bigger project, which is going to be rehabbing these tanks and, and bringing them back to like new condition, you know, for the, for, for the future of this, this, this critical component. So. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Great, thank you, Scott. And thank you for providing an overview of this really important project. Um, if uh, I see there's one TAC member question. So uh, Craig, go ahead, question, comment. Yeah, thank you, Scott, for the presentation. Uh, there's just a couple items that I think the public's gonna be you know, laser focused on. Um, one is, is there a, I, I recognize these operations usually are very sensitive to, you know, when, when the demands are during the year, is there a drop dead kind of contract end date for draining a tank like May 1st or something when demands are starting to ramp back up again? And then the second question I had, um, and I think you may have mentioned it, but I didn't catch it when, when the tank is drained. Is it drained on demands? Because um, I think people are going to say, wow, you can't just drain water, obviously, you know, down the slope or something. So if you could just remind me what those two um, items were. Thanks. Sure. Uh, so when the tanks are drained, um, we're going to we're able to drain almost the entire tank back into the system. Um, so we'll we'll drain it back into the system. We're, we're going to get down to a, a couple, three, two, three inches in the bottom of the tank. That part will be will be pumped to ground. Um, and by the way, um, when we're doing that cleaning and that last piece of water, that's all going to go through filtration bags um, uh, through our non our, our non storm water uh, permit release program and what have you to control all those flows. So that's that's all handled. But it, it's definitely we're definitely going to do everything we can to minimize the amount of water um, that that comes out. And and we. 
you know, we get that down pretty, pretty low. Um, as far as a date on the draining of the tanks, we don't have a drop dead date. We, you know, we're meeting internally, looking at demands um, and what have you to to do those. So, for example, uh, Annadale one that I mentioned, we're gonna we're gonna do that big inspection and take it offline. The plan is we're targeting January for that. So, um, you know, during the winter months um, when, when the demands are a little lower in terms of irrigation or maybe an emergency service or a fire or what have you, I, I don't know. Um, but but in, in trying to target those dates when, when demands are a little lower. Um, now, that may not always be the case. And, and before we do that work and take that tank offline, we're meeting internally um, to look at all of those those circumstances and, and try to figure out those dates. So, Anadel 1 is targeted for... Uh, January, um, the next tank, I can't remember which one it is, um, is targeted uh, for February. So that tank, during those inspections, we expect it to be offline for about a month um, while we do that that thorough inspection and cleaning and what have you. Um, subsequent, the visual inspections, the tank won't be offline at all. Um, the cleaning, it'll be off for a couple of weeks. So. Great, thank you. Thanks, Craig. Are there any other questions or comments from the TAC? All right, thanks, Scott. And I'm guessing you're coordinating some water operations staff for coordinating with contractor staff uh, so that folks know, or yeah. operation staff so that folks know when you're planning, what it's gonna look like, if we need to try and uh, top off storage to some extent in our systems to help with uh, whatever that deficit and storage will be when you take the take the tank offline absolutely great thank you any other questions or comments from uh TAC members all right seeing none um we're now taking public comments on item number seven um if you wish to make a comment via zoom please raise your hand and if you're dialing in via telephone dial star nine and Secretary Ledesma, can you please facilitate, uh, I see we have one hand, can you facilitate public comment on this item? Yes, we do have a public comment from Brenda Edelman. Brenda, you do have permissions to speak now. Can you hear me? Um, my question, yes, can. thank you. Um, my question, I was just wondering what kind of, um, if any water quality testing you do of the water in the tank, do you do it an, on an ongoing basis periodically? Um, do you test the water at the bottom to see what the quality is there and what kinds of constituents would you test for if you do? So um, in terms of the system, yeah, we, we have various test points throughout the system that test um, for, for water quality and there's a whole standard set of tests. Um, not really my area, but, but yeah, there, there are. In terms of this tank program, when we, when we take a tank offline and drain it, we're gonna, we're gonna filter all that, drain it, um, and then we're gonna, when we put it back online, we're gonna chlorinate it. Uh, you know, drain it, run, run tests, uh, back to tests, and make sure that we meet all water quality requirements before we put that tank back online. Thank you. You're welcome. We do not have any additional public comments. All right, thank you. And again, thank you, Scott, uh, for giving us an overview of this program. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right, uh, we're now going to move on to agenda item number eight, which is our biological opinion status update. And we're going to have David Manning with Sonoma Water giving our presentation. Welcome, David. We haven't seen you in a while. It has been a little while. Thanks, Jennifer. Everybody hear me okay? Very yes, good. we can. All right. So uh, this is probably looking pretty familiar. I, I know we update these, we, we really do, but uh, some of these things change slowly. So on the fish flow project, uh, you're not going to see any, any new action there, but there is work going on, uh, certainly behind the scenes. Uh, I would say to adapt to the ever-changing Potter Valley project and its consequences for the Russian River. So uh, rest assured, uh, staff are working uh, both uh, in Don's group on the uh, water resources planning and environmental side to try to figure out um, a way to uh, predict the future in 
uh, the eel and the Russian River watershed, which is uh, a challenge that I think oh, more than 100 people probably grapple with on a weekly basis. Um, moving into the Dry Creek project, maybe we'll slide down the screen just a little bit there. We do have a lot of great work going on there. And Jennifer, I'm glad that you could join us a couple of weeks ago to see some of the progress out there. Um, we're working right now, or I should say the Army Corps of Engineers is working, managing the construction for phase four of the Dry Creek project in, in REACH 13. It's a two year construction process for each phase of the work in Dry Creek. So they're, they're getting close to wrapping up their work in uh, REACH 13A, 13B has already been completed. Next year, they'll return to the site, the same contractor, McCullough Construction, uh, and we'll work on Reach 10. In total, that's about 1.2 miles of habitat enhancement on the creek, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's really looking fantastic. Uh, I was out there last week with uh, the designers, Interfluve, and our internal team, uh, and, and we're really pleased with what we see so far. So we're excited to, to get those projects uh, wrapped up for the construction season, um, demobilize the site, and come back and, and do some more work next year. Our construction season runs until October 15th. If there is no rain forecasted, uh, we can on a week to week basis with the resource agencies concurrence continue to, uh, to do some work on the site. We're also gonna plan to do a little bit of pre-work to make uh, the construction season faster this, uh, this next summer when we can start um, working in the water June 15th. So maybe we'll slide down the screen just a little bit more. You can see some images here from a groundbreaking ceremony. This may have been reported previously. The Army Corps of Engineers had a kickoff uh, for their project. And this is a total uh, $27 million federal investment. Uh, so it's a sort of a big deal for the Corps to finally get to this phase. And I think all of you know how long it took for us to get the authorization and the funding for this project. So we're, we're very excited that they found it worthy of celebration. And, and that celebration happened on the 16th of August. Slide down a little bit more on the screen. Here's just an example of uh, some of the work as it's being constructed, and and it does look messy. You see some sheet pile uh, in the foreground there that helps to isolate the construction area from the rest of the creek and and keep the water quality that results from the disturbance of all that sediment contained within the construction area and not released into the stream. We can slide down a little bit more on the screen. The habitat monitoring work uh, is continuous. Uh, our crews are out in the stream all summer long, uh, measuring what was constructed previously, um, taking a look at the areas that will be constructed this next year to collect uh, the pre-construction data. Uh, in total, uh, that work has showed us that uh, roughly 80% of the projects that be constructed uh, meet or exceed the National Marine Fisheries Services and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife requirements. So we're really happy with the way the work is maturing over time. Uh, this next section here uh, in the update talks about the future and some of our, our planning right now with the, the landowners in the Dry Creek Valley. Everybody knows that that's a big uh, challenge uh, and we're meeting it certainly in, in this next phase of the work. Uh, we presented offers to the owners so that the core can advertise those projects uh, early next year in preparation uh, for construction sort of simultaneously in uh, the phase five, as well as the continuing work on, on phase four of the project. Uh, we're still in the process of uh, negotiating with and working with landowners on phase six. That work won't start until uh, 2024. We did meet with the Dry Creek Valley Association's board uh, back on August 17th. I gave them an update of the work in Dry Creek. And uh, of course our fish monitoring continues. And, and this is something that we're uh, there's a little bit of overlap here between the temporary urgency change uh, petition update uh, and the biological opinion update. Try to coordinate those uh, surveys as much as possible with the video system operating out of the inflatable dam at Mirabel. Uh, to date, in terms of the video that we have been able to monitor, because we have multiple activities ongoing, we're not up to date with all the monitoring of the video that's been collected. But we did look immediately after that last rainstorm that we had. We have not seen any fish yet. But we would expect with the flows currently in the lower river uh, to see some movement of probably Chinook salmon, sometimes a few steelhead early in the year. Um, the month of October, especially mid-October to mid-November is typically the time we see most of those adult salmonids begin to return to the river. 
Let's slide down a little bit more on the screen. One happy story uh, from this past uh, year, last winter, was the increased number of cove salmon that returned to the watershed. You can see that the counts in, in 2020 and 2021 uh, were, were low, lower than they had been in the previous four years. And those numbers rebounded um, quite substantially this past year. And with the relatively mild winter that we had, um, a lot of those uh, juveniles fared well in the stream. So our crews are reporting seeing a lot of young coho salmon out in the watershed right now. This figure here, the difference between what you see is the expanded count and that minimum count um, is related to how we detect fish moving uh, through the watershed and into these streams. Uh, the raw count of those fish is in green, but through the use of electronic tags um, and some mark and recapture techniques, we're able to expand the number of fish that we see uh, because only a portion of them carry those electronic tags. So it's a, it's a way of scaling up the number of fish. It's done in a very statistically rigorous way, and it really helps us assess how well this code program is working. You can see from uh, the inception of the program in the early 2000s to now, uh, we, we have coast salmon present in the watershed. And a lot of those fish are taking advantage of those habitats in Dry Creek and being released into Dry Creek directly. So uh, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a success story. In the estuary, not a lot uh, to report. Um, we've continued to do our monitoring there. The estuary has been open for a very long period of time this summer and, and even into this fall, which is a bit unusual. Um, we would expect uh, as swells change uh, this fall to, to start to see some closures. On the temporary urge to change petition piece, um, I think a lot of this information here, uh, every, everybody is well aware of. Our monitoring requirements do begin to change here in the fall. So in addition to running the video, uh, we do have to assess some of the pools in the lower Russian River for the presence of adult fish, and we'll be doing that <laughs> over the coming month. Uh, the same thing is true in Dry Creek and then upstream uh, into the upper Russian River as soon as more fish are observed on the video at Mirabel. So um, the resource agencies have us not just relying on the video, but also looking around our crews uh, in the river, snorkeling, measuring some of the, uh, the riffles, the shallow areas in the lower Russian River uh, to assess how well the flows we're releasing, especially from Lake Sonoma and Dry Creek, are meeting the migration needs of the fish. And last but not least, uh, the biological assessment uh, for the new biological opinion is making great progress. Uh, this week, uh, we are receiving uh, a complete administrative draft, an, an internal draft for, for our review and the Army Corps of Engineers review. Uh, the first time we've seen it all sort of put together. Um, we will review that and then turn that over to the resource agencies for their first real look uh, at, at this biological assessment. And that's sort of an iterative process. Um, we won't hand over what we consider a sort of draft final to the resource agencies until February of next year. And of course, that biological opinion expires in September, late September uh, of next year. So we're hoping to have everything in place with the new biological opinion before that. And that is all I have, Jennifer. Thank you, David. Are there any questions or comments from members of the TAC? All right, not seeing any. Um, just in terms, uh, David, I don't know if you can talk to this a little bit, but in terms of the fish flow project and the draft EIR and the schedule with the new um, biolog or the the new biological opinion coming. Is it safe to say that we're not going to see uh, likely the draft EIR until after the biological opinion is in a final form? We're assuming that uh, the schedule to deliver the next uh, iteration of the official project will follow into the new biological opinion, um, at least in terms of the expectation to have it delivered in the way that NIMS imagined it would be to the state board. So our work to continue to develop that draft may, may beat that timeline of the date at which the biological opinion expires, but the need to have uh, the fish flow EIR included in the next biological assessment is, is a certainty because our our objective to deliver it to the state board will take 
longer than the time we currently have to complete the existing biological opinion. Okay. Yes. So, so do you have a, a sense of, um, you mentioned February of next year for potentially a, a final draft. Do you have a sense of when uh, a public document will be available for the biological opinion? So I, I had anticipated that question. A, a public document, it's interesting, is not a part of the National Marine Fisheries Services process mm -hmm. until there's a federal register notice um, of the sort of complete uh, biological opinion. So we'll talk to the resource agencies about uh, a schedule for releasing some of that information publicly, but it is, uh, if it follows along with the last biological opinion, there is quite a bit of internal discussion between uh, Sonoma Water, the Army Corps, and the resource agencies very close to the time that the, the, the expiration date is anticipated of the current BO. So I, I don't have a great answer for you yet, Jennifer, about when that information can be discussed publicly. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll certainly, we'll take that to the resource agencies when we give them a draft and, and talk to them about that. Okay. But I, uh, but I know there's quite, there's quite a bit of work um, sort of up to the last minute, if you will, um, with that schedule. And a lot of that is driven by the, the resource agencies, pretty exhaustive review of these materials. They get input from uh, a lot of folks in their vertical chain, um, all of their counsel, have coordinators that deal with this that are not the folks that um, that we typically negotiate with and discuss um, terms and conditions of the, of the existing permit with. So this is uh, it, it's a, it's a it's a pretty big deal for them, and it takes a while. So it may be sometime in the fall if it's close. Uh, to I think no. I I would assume it is sometime next okay. year. No, fall of next year is what I meant. Correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. Indeed. Fall fall of twenty twenty three. Correct. <laughs> Okay, and I, so I'm guessing that the draft EIR is probably going to be somewhere along that same schedule then. I hope so. <laughs> All right, <laughs> thank you. Any other questions or comments uh, from TAC members? All right, seeing none, uh, we're going to uh, open up for public comment on this item. Uh, so we are now taking public comments on this item. If you would like, to, uh, this is item number eight. If you would like to make a comment, please raise your hand via Zoom. If you are on the phone, dial star nine. And I see we do have one hand on uh, raised. So Secretary Ledesma, can you facilitate public comment on this item? Yes, we have a public comment from Brenda Edelman. You have permissions to talk. I have some questions similar to Jennifer's. Um, during the first round, it, the biological assessment, I think, took a couple of years, but there was a public review process at the end of it. Then the um, National Marine Fishery Service took one year or more to write the biological opinion for which there was no public review, unfortunately. Um, and I'm just wondering, the EIR you mentioned, is that the, coming after the biological assessment? And I guess you're uncertain as to when that would be released, but I would assume it would be before uh, the final, I, I don't know, maybe you could explain that just a little bit more. Sure, so there is there is most certainly a very public process for EIR, as you're well aware, Brenda. And um, the, the EIR and the biological assessment, the biological opinion are related, but they're not linked in terms of their timing of release for public review, if that makes sense. Um, not quite. <laughs> so we're assuming that uh, we're assuming that the current draft EIR and its timeline will extend into the next biological opinion. So it is we will we will it is likely we will not complete 
all of the public review and work necessary on the current draft EIR by September of 2023 when the new biological opinion is issued. If that if that makes sense, is that clear? So there, the to the two timelines are not linked in that way, and the resource agencies are well aware of this. Um, so there is, you are correct in terms of the timing um, of review for the previous biological assessment. Uh, the length of time it took to prepare that biological assessment was was, was actually almost ten years. Um, and a lot of the work that occurred under that biological assessment was, was, was very new information gathered about the Russian River watershed and, and our system and how it relates to impacts on cell mods. The current work on this biological assessment follows very closely the existing biological opinion. So um, there, there are no big surprises in how we describe the operations of our system uh, the impacts that, that those operations have on someone as it really follows very closely the existing biological opinion. So the amount of time it takes for the resource agencies to review that information is expedited. Um, and, and the information that would be available to the public uh, should the National Fishery Service choose to um, uh, allow that is, is very similar to what you find in the existing GEO. So we did not, uh, we started with that existing biological opinion as the template and described uh, our progress in meeting the goals of the biological opinion. And that's the basis of the biological assessment that we'll hand to the resource agencies. So but very different. We've learned a lot um, in the last 20 years uh, or more of biological assessment, assessment and biological opinion implementation. Does that I, help, Brenda? I, I still have one follow-up. It sounds to me like the EIR will take place after the biological opinion is released, which would mean it would have no impact on the biological opinion. Am I correct about that? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what you mean about impact on a biological opinion. Um, you know, the, the National Fishery Service would still like to see uh, what they requested and what we've suggested is implementable in a draft EIR completed as part of the biological opinion, I should say, the, the section seven consultation process, right? So they will ask that we continue to work on submitting and getting that petition uh, to the, the State Water Resources Control Board. Is that does that help? No, it, will, it will be a requirement of the biological. It will be a requirement of the next biological opinion that we um, complete the, the EIR process. I guess the only thing I'm trying to figure out is, is there any influence the public can have on the biological opinion and what the requirements are in that document? Um, I, I think the short answer is there's probably limited impact that the public can have, honestly, on the biological opinion. But there's a lot of influence, as you know, Brenda, that the public will have over the EIR and flows in the river. Well, maybe I'll talk to you further another time on this. Certainly. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Brenda. And I think um, I think if I'm summarizing correctly, uh, similar questions we had asked in the past, but just trying to better understand the public process. And I think we've been told that this is a this is really a Section Seven consultation, which is in between the agencies, and we're not going to really see anything until there's pretty much a final product. So, um, all right. Any other questions or comments um, on this item? We do, comments. we do not have any more public comments on this item. Great. Thank you, Easter, and or thank you, Secretary Ledesma, and thank you, David, for the presentation. Thank you. All right. Uh, we are now going to move on to item number nine, uh, Potter Valley Project Update, and Don Seymour with Sonoma Water <clears throat> making this presentation. 
So there's not a lot to report since Pam's update or since Pam reported out at the last TAC meeting in September, Jennifer. Um, uh, there hasn't been any any updates on from PG&E on where they are with the surrender process. Um, however, they are uh, uh, underway. Um, FERC did approve their work plan and schedule back at the end of July. I would report that um, PG&E is still managing the Potter Valley project under the FERC order that approved their variance request. Um, that that'll stay in place, uh, or it, it won't expire until. Uh, storage at Lake uh, Pillsbury exceeds 36,000 acre feet. And right now they're at about, I believe around 34.5 and declining because of a consultation with Fish and Wildlife and NIMPS on releasing block water for um, improved habitat conditions below uh, Scott Dam and Cape Horn Dam. So they're planning on re releasing approximately 2,500 acre feet. I think they're about getting close to halfway through that uh, that amount, and then uh, so it, 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 this this variance will remain in place until we start seeing some storm events, um, which means uh, inflows into Lake Mendocino are going to be pretty darn low. Uh, PVIDs really cut back on their requests. As of October 15th, their maximum delivery request goes to five CFS, and then the um, East Fork. Uh, minimum release under this variance is, is 5 CFS. So starting October 15th, we'll see about 10 CFS coming in through the project until the variance expires. That's all I have. That all you have. Um, Don, I don't know if you can talk to this, but I believe it's related. Um, can you just give a quick update on the work that's happening um, on the DWR grant in relation to the Russian River Water Forum and oh, the invitations that just went out uh, late last week? Yeah, so um, just to remind everybody, Sonoma Water received uh, $2.1 million to, for three different tasks related to Potter Valley. Um, the first being a um, basically a risk analysis due diligence of uh, the diversion facilities and you know what type of capital projects would be necessary to make them function uh, without Scott Dam and uh, risk of owning those 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 facilities and ongoing uh, O and M costs. That um, scope of work has been uh, finalized and it's being incorporated into an agreement right now. It should be going across Grant's desk in the next week or so, and so that works right about to get uh, we're right about to get started with that. And the, the consultant that was selected for that work was McMillan Jacobs, who's very familiar with. Uh, they, they they were they've done a uh, they've done a fair amount of work under um, with the two basin solution parties uh, uh, previously, so they're really familiar with the project. Um, the second uh, task is for basically an integrated water management evaluation of of, of Potter Valley. You know, so looking for uh, what opportunities there are for um, the Potter Valley you know, to continue and have an adequate water supply under that run of the river uh, scenario where you would only have a seasonal transfer of water. So looking at, at uh, um, uh, alternatives for maybe managed aquifer recharge, uh, groundwater banking opportunities, even some surface water storage opportunities. Um, we're working with Jacobs Engineering, not to be confused with McMillan Jacobs, a completely different firm, Jacobs is the firm that's doing the resiliency work for, for Snow Water and the contractors. Um, so we're looking at hopefully finalizing their scope of work in the next week or so and getting that work underway by the end of October. And then lastly, as you mentioned, there's that Russian River Water Users Forum. I'm not quite as familiar. That's uh, that's that's really being run by Mike Thompson and Brad Sherwood, who I would actually pass it over to, who could probably provide a, a, a better update than I can. Thanks, Don. Uh, we do have a steering committee of staff and stakeholders working on the Russian River Water Forum uh, with the invitation from Grant going out for those interviews. Uh, those interviews should be conducted within the next month. There's roughly 45 stakeholders who will be interviewed on behalf of the Russian River Water Forum. And uh, Kearns and West is helping us with that along with uh, Mark Milan. So I will just say that uh, perhaps at the next uh, WAC and TAC meeting, we'll have a more 
informative update on that effort as the stakeholder interviews uh, progress. Great, thank you both. And just as a reminder, um, I did let everyone know that an uh, invite was coming to the WAC and TAC members. Uh, so you should have seen that uh, go out on Friday, as well as uh, everyone else who was identified to be in the stakeholder group. So um, with that, any questions or comments from TAC members on uh, Potter Valley project? All right, seeing none, uh, we will now take public comment on item nine. Uh, if you wish to make a comment via Zoom, uh, raise your hand. And if you're dialing in via phone, please dial star nine. And Secretary Ledesma, do we have any public comment on this item? We do not have any public comments. All right, thank you so much. And thank you, Don, for that update. Uh, we're now going to move on to agenda item number 10, which is our Sonoma Water Government Affairs update. And Brad Sherwood will be making the presentation. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Uh, this will be a brief update on the federal of the house here. Uh, your soil water team is going to Washington DC in two weeks with a coalition of agencies from throughout the West to advocate and educate Congress on seasonal to sub-seasonal forecasting needs. As I reported out uh, last meeting, we did get a million dollar uh, appropriation for an S2S uh, potential pilot project in the West Coast on this type of forecasting need. Uh, the head of delegation for this trip is Janine Jones from DWR, the Interstate Water Resources Manager and a representative from the Western States Water Council. So uh, our small delegation, which is essentially just Grant Davis and myself, uh, will report back on those outcomes of those meetings uh, at the WAC and TAC meeting. On the uh, state side, as you all know, the governor had until last Friday to sign um, well over 1,100 bills. Um, as of Tuesday the 27th, he had vetoed 60, and uh, we are still coming through his actions. One action that we're familiar with, uh, and Jennifer knows this, is uh, Senate Bill 222 did get vetoed by the governor. That is something that uh, Aqua closely watched for us, and I'm happy to send around the governor's message on that. But essentially, um, the Water Rate Assistance Program and Water Rate Assistance Fund uh, would have provided a water affordability assistance for drinking and wastewater services to low income rate payers through the state water board. However, it would be a permanent program with no funding tied to it. So the governor said once there is permanent funding sources allocated for this program, he would reconsider that. Uh, that's, uh, I will send out that letter to everybody. On the government affairs side, um, we've got some tours coming up with our uh, amazing water contractors here. We're revving up for the Valley of the Moon Water District to come out and take a tour of our uh, Waller Mirabel uh, Sonoma Water Booster Station. We're gonna see the Spring Lake tanks. So that's this Wednesday, looking forward to having those folks out. Uh, we have a, a pending tour with Santa Rosa Water and also North Marin. So we're just looking to get those scheduled nailed down and uh, welcome you all out to do similar tours. Again, please uh, feel free to give me an email if you and your staff or, or board would like a tour of our system, we're happy to oblige and do that. Uh, staff meeting pre uh, presentations. Um, I, again, we welcome invitations to you all to come present to our staff. It's kind of the water contractor 101 talk. Our strategic plan, we're finalizing our key objectives. We hope to have our final strategic plan, something we can present to the WAC and TAC at the next meeting. Uh, we're gonna have probably an internal rollout of that sometime in late November, early December. We have a new infrastructure video uh, coming out. Uh, yours truly, uh, Mr. Scott Carter, who just did his uh, VIP presentation here today. We're gonna do a nice uh, video on that storage tank uh, maintenance project and these videos, again, are made for all of us here on this call. So while we post them to our YouTube and social media videos, we'd love to collaborate with your communications PIO staff to get as many eyeballs on these videos so folks can learn more about our infrastructure projects. 
Speaking of that, uh, we do hope that you all are participating in the Day Without Water. Uh, it's October 20th. I know our communications PIO team is, they're working on a, a social media campaign on that day. So please do reach out to Andrea Rodriguez of our uh, PIO team uh, to, to coordinate potentially as needed. And of course it is Water Professionals Appreciation Week. So I just felt like uh, just making sure that we all know that and that hopefully everyone is appreciating your staff. And um, we, we've got a social media campaign again that our communications team is engaging right now. Um, so uh, just, just a heads up in case you didn't know that. And that is it, Jennifer, short and sweet. Great, thank you, Brad. And thank you for bringing up Water Professionals Appreciation Week. I know we uh, here in Santa Rosa are very much celebrating this week and we adopted a, a proclamation at our council last week. Uh, we're gonna be having some uh, board members and other members come out and speak to our staff and just thank them for all the great work they do. So hopefully everyone else is uh, is uh, recognizing your staff this week. Um, any questions or comments from uh, any TAC members on Brad's report? All right, seeing none. Uh, we'll now take public comment on item 10. If you wish to make a comment by Zoom, raise your hand. If you're on the phone, dial star nine. And Secretary Ledesma, do we have any public comments on this item? We do not have any public comments. All right. Um, okay, thank you very much, Brad, and uh, good luck to you and Grant back in DC. Just bring all that money back to us, please. <laughs> All right, uh, we will now move on to item 11, items for next agenda. Uh, reminder that next month's meeting is a joint um, WAC-TAC meeting, and that will take place on November the 7th. And uh, we will be um, meeting in person, in person only at the WAC-TAC meeting on November 7th. So just wanted to remind everyone. Um, are there any particular items that folks are hoping to see on the agenda? All right, hearing none, I think we'll have our typical updates. Um, and uh, if there are no questions or comments, I'll open up for public comment on item number 11. If you wish to make a comment, please uh, raise your hand via Zoom or dial star nine on the phone. And Secretary Ledesma, do we have any public comments on this item? We do not have any public comments on this item. All right, great, thank you very much. Um, and with that, we will adjourn. Happy Water Professionals Week, happy new water year, and uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. <laughs>